Welcome to our AP Chemistry discussion of titration and standardization. We're going to do a titration, a very useful, very practical, very common technique for analysis. If I could imagine anything older than uh, titration, I, I think it might simply be redox, and that would be by pure accident of mixing things together and seeing what happens. Uh, very, very useful, common, and as much as you th think colorimetry would be good for everything, titration is probably better for everything. With a titration, the goal is to determine something of an unknown, which will be in my flask here, by titrating it with a known. And so knowing all the information I need to know about my titrant here in the burette, I'll be able to calculate my unknown. Now in this particular version that we're going to be doing in class, we're going to be looking for the molar mass of an unknown acid. So there's my acid right there. Yes, you can see the label is white because I, it's unknown. You don't know what it is. It's a mystery acid. Doesn't that sound exciting? So with our unknown acid, we're going to determine the molar mass and we're going to do it by titration. So I'm sure you're thinking in your head, how do we do that? Well, if you're still thinking in your head, how do we do that? That means you haven't been thinking. To determine molar mass, what do you need? I hope you said simply we need grams per mole. Okay. So I have an unknown solid, okay, unknown solid acid right here, and I want to determine a molar mass for it. So what do I need to know? Well, I need to know grams and I need to know moles. It's that easy. How might I find grams? of an unknown solid acid? Yeah, right? We, we put it in one of these super fancy weigh boats and we put it on a balance, being sure we zero out the weigh boat ahead of time. So I have my already balanced, already measured grams amount of my unknown acid here. So really, why are we doing the titration? We're doing the titration to determine the moles part. We've got the grams part, check, we're good to go there. It's that moles part that we're going to be doing with our titration. Now I want to show you this setup because your setup is going to need to be like this. I have a burette and a clamp up here and it is closed. And I point out I have double rinsed the burette. Why should we double rinse it? Excellent question. You'll remember back when we used our glass pipettes, we double rinsed them. When I wash this out with water, and you certainly want to wash it out with water first because you have no clue what's been in it over the years. So wash it well with water, letting the water run through the tip and swirling it all around inside. Okay, Wash it well with water, but as much as you think you can dump out the water inside, there's still water clinging to the surface of this glass or plastic, whatever yours is made out of. Ours is glass, which is very nice that water will dilute the solution we're about to put inside. And especially with the large surface area for the volume that a burette or a pipette would give us, okay, we did the same thing with our pipettes. Remember how we rinsed them with water and then sucked in some of our solution and squirted that out before we used them? Same thing here. I put some of my sodium hydroxide into my burette and I've swirled it around and I let it drip through the tip and I use about 10 milliliters, that's all about all I needed, which actually looks like that much in the burette. It looks like a lot and that's the whole issue. We get a lot of surface area for volume with the burette, which is why we like burettes. They're great for making good measurements with, but it is a necessary step to double rinse it. Rinse it once with water, rinse it a second time with your solution. After swirling it around and letting some pour through the tip and all that good stuff, I dumped all that out in the sink because I don't want to use any of that. And then I fill it as much as I want to fill it with my sodium hydroxide because it is sodium hydroxide we're using as our titrant this time. I point out that if you uh, are nervous about pouring even from a little beaker into the burette, use a funnel. And you do not necessarily need to start at the very top. Um, in fact, it's probably a waste of time to try to start at the very top because you're going to spend longer trying to get it at exactly the very top than it would be just to let it not be at the top. 
So be conscious about your time. So I have my double rinse burette, and then I have a flask, which I made sure was clean. I don't need to double rinse it because I'm not putting anything into it. It just needs to be rinsed. And I have measured out my unknown acid. So I'm going to take my unknown acid, which I have measured the grams of, and I've recorded on my paper over here. I've recorded the grams of this, and I'm going to put in the flask. Now I know you're going to ask, so don't bother asking, how many grams should we use? Well, the lab says about one to two grams. And I know you're still going to ask, well, then how many grams should we use? Let me point it out this way. When you do any chemistry lab experiments, we want to reduce any error that we might introduce, in this case, like by reading the burette. So let's say I am a super bad chemist, and I'm reading the burette, and I'm off by as much as one milliliter. Now, I mean, this is, let me get my fingernails going there, right there. That is the distance in the burette of one milliliter. Now, certainly I can measure better than that, but let's say I'm just awful at chemistry, and I measure one milliliter off. If I use a little bit of acid in, that I've measured out, I'm only going to use up a little bit of titrant before I get to the end point. If I put a lot of acid, then I'm going to be able to use a lot of titrant. So one milliliter, if I'm only going to use 10 milliliters in total because I have a little bit of acid, that would be a large percent error, and that would be bad. But if I have, say, 100 grams here, so I'm going to use a lot of titrant, well, then my error is going to be itty bitty. That one milliliter is not going to make much effect. On the other hand, we're going to be here forever doing the titration. So with chemistry, it's always a choice between your time, being green and not overusing chemicals, and reducing that error as small as possible. So you want enough that you can have enough titrant that your any error you might introduce in reading the lines is not going to be large but you also don't want an, too much that you're going to be here forever and not be green with your chemicals because otherwise that's a lot of sodium hydroxide used for simply lab purposes okay so with that said i've measured out 1.67 grams that's just I, I dumped some in and that's what the the scale told me and i caught it good so i'm going to take that and I'm going to put that into my flask. And I can see there's still some clinging, but that's all right, because I was going to add water to my flask anyway. Now, excuse me while I go grab my water. Okay, so I've got my water, and I was going to add water to the flask anyway, so I might as well start by adding the water to my weigh boat. Okay adding some water to my weigh boat and pouring down the same corner that I poured the solid down. Now I'm fairly certain all the solid is out of my weigh boat and into the flask. How much water do we want to end up putting in the flask? Well, you should have read the lab, and the lab says enough to dissolve it. And how much is enough to dissolve it? Well, you sit here and you add some water and you swirl, and you see if it dissolves, and if that doesn't dissolve, you add a little more and you swirl, and you see if it dissolves, and you just keep going like that. And you're like, well, does it not matter how much water we put in? Well, I know you're asking that, but think back to what we're doing. Think for a change, okay? We're looking for moles. So is water going to affect how many moles of acids in there? No. It, it'll affect the concentration, most definitely, but I'm not after concentration for my formula. I'm after moles. Just moles. That's all I'm looking for. So I know the grams that I've put in. That's the top part of, that's the numerator of my fraction. I need to know moles, and that's what I'm going to get done with the titration here. So I'm going to sit here, and I'm going to add water and swirl, and I still see solid. Now you're like, oh, okay, well, if we use less solid, wouldn't it dissolve faster? Yes, absolutely. Okay, less solid would need less water for dissolving. And also, you know, sitting here for a while and swirling does help. Can you add too much water? Well, you could add so much water that it like overflows the flask. That would be an issue. But other than that, again, the amount of water is not going to affect our results because we're not going for concentration. We're going for moles. 
and I see just a few grains left, so I'm going to add just a little bit more and call that good. Oh yes, I see no, no solid left, so I'm ready to go. So check it out, I have my double rinsed burette filled with sodium hydroxide. How much sodium hydroxide? Uh, I'll get to it that in a moment. I have my flask and I've added my solid acid and I've added my water and I'm ready to titrate with my sodium hydroxide into my acid and see the moles. Oh wait, 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 I'm not ready. How am I going to know when I've added enough sodium hydroxide into my flask? Exactly, I'm not. I haven't added an indicator. So let's add our phenolphthalein. So over here we have phenolphthalein, probably a large enough bottle to last us for 20 years. Okay. How much phenolphthalein should you add? Two to three drops. So one, two, three. Call that good. Okay. Three drops of phenolphthalein. So I've got my phenolphthalein. Now I'm going to actually swirl that to be sure it's mixed in as well. Got my phenolphthalein in with my dissolved acid. I've got my double rinse burette with my sodium hydroxide. Now I'm ready to go. We wanted phenolphthalein. We needed an indicator. We needed to know when I've added enough titrant, enough base to the acid to neutralize it. And phenolphthalein is usually a very good choice. Phenolphthalein is clear in acids. That's why it's still clear. And it's gonna, if I added it up here into my uh, burette, it would turn a pinkish purple color because it's pink in base. It switches around an, an endpoint of 8 on the pH scale, which you're like, well, I thought neutral was 7. Yeah, but the difference between 7 and 8 in a titration is typically not a big difference. You really could be talking drops difference. So it's really okay that my phenolphthalein changes around 8 and I'm looking for 7. It certainly will be close enough to give us the information we want. Um, there are other, t other indicators, obviously, that would switch at other pHs. So it, knowing what pH you want, you just look up in a chart and see where the indicator is. Officially, around the pH that you want it to switch colors... I go from like, hey, not enough to enough. You want that pH to be equal to the pKa of the indicator. And if you're going, what's a pKa? Well, then you hold off on that thought till you get to Ka's and Kb's equilibrium constants. And then you've got a pKa is the natural log, of, sorry, the negative logarithm of a Ka. So we could actually look in a color coding chart by pH. We could look in a list of indicators by Ka's and determine what the P, when they're the pH and the pKa is about the same. That would be a good choice as your changing pH should be very similar to the pKa of the indicator. Okay, I'm ready to do the titration. How do I do the titration? Well, well first off, I don't splash out, so don't do that. Okay, so I'm ready here and I'm going to start adding and at the start Okay, and normally I would be fully in front of this, but at the start, I'm letting it just pour out of my burette into my flask. And I do see it turning a pinkish color as I do that, and then suddenly that pink goes away, and it's going to fool you a lot that way. Okay, so it's important to swirl, and it's important to keep an eye on the flask, not the burette, but the flask. Okay because this is what I am going for. And you notice how quickly that achieved. So I needed just a f little bit. And in fact, I should have slowed down and gone drop by drop had I not been making this video. Um, I would have taken the time, most certainly, to go drop by drop. But I'm looking for this nice pinkish purple color that tells me I'm done. Okay, so I did that, and you know what? That would have done me no good at all if I hadn't already marked my beginning point, my beginning milliliters, 
and my ending point, my ending milliliters. Okay, so before you start, be sure that you mark the initial volume in your burette and the final volume, obviously, when you're done. Okay, so my initial volume and my final volume, and then I'm ready to go. So now that it is pink and I have my molar mass here, okay, or sorry, I, my, I don't have my molar mass. I'm looking for my molar mass. Now that it's pink and I know it's been neutralized, I'm going to use the information from my titrant to find what that acid was. So again, let's focus. I'm looking for moles of acid. I have grams of acid. I measured that. I'm looking for moles of acid. So what do I need to start with? Well, I need to start with the sodium hydroxide. I started with sodium hydroxide that I think is one molar. I think it's one molar. I'll come back to that, and this is the importance of standardizing, but I think it's one molar. Well, if it's one molar, that means I think I have one mole of sodium hydroxide <coughs> for every one liter of solution. Now, obviously, I'm not using a full liter in my burette. That would be crazy, but one molar for one liter, and so that's going to start off my roto track. So I'm going to start my roto track with that information. So here's my roto track for finding the moles of the acid. I know, doesn't it look awesome? Okay. So I'm starting with the idea that one mole of sodium hydroxide in 1,000 milliliters because I have a one molar solution of sodium hydroxide. I think. I'll get back to the idea of standardizing in a moment. Now I need the volume that I actually used from the burette. Now please note this. Often on the test they ask in an experiment like this, what do you need to measure and what is calculated? I don't measure the milliliters of base that I used. I calculate that. I measure a beginning and an end and then I subtract. And doing math like subtraction is a calculation. So be sure that you label it correctly. I need to measure the start and end here. Okay, so I measured the start and I measured the end. And I do point out you can, you know, twist the burette around, you can raise or lower the burette, whatever you need to do. You do want the meniscus, which in my case is way up here. You want the meniscus at eye level when you read it. That is for the best results. And don't forget that it's measured with the bigger numbers as you go down, which is the way you're still supposed to read it. So what I'm seeing now, I'm going to take into my calculator. I'm going to take my 16.70. Remember, you can measure in between the lines. I'm going to point this out on this burette. My little lines are to the tenths place, so I'm going to go to the hundredths place. If your measurements are not to the right amount of significant digits, you're going to lose points on your lab when I grade it. So be sure that you take care of that. So I've got my final, and I'm going to subtract from it my initial. And I get 12.18 milliliters is what I used. So putting that into my road track for right now, my one molar sodium hydroxide times, and now notice how I wrote it as one mole over a thousand milliliters so that I can multiply by 12.18 milliliters that I use and those milliliters are going to cancel. Okay. So when I do that math, I get, well, with milliliters canceled, I get moles of sodium hydroxide. Well, that's great because I want to turn from moles of sodium hydroxide to moles of my unknown acid. Now, if you read the lab, I tell you the, the unknown acid is monoprotic, one hydrogen. So one hydroxide and one hydrogen are going to be the ratios there. If this was different, if this was magnesium hydroxide, there'd be a different ratio. If this was not monoprotic, if it was diprotic or triprotic, there'd be a different ratio. But it's one of the reasons I pick a monoprotic acid, so it's a one-to-one -one ratio there. Okay, so. I've got my milliliters canceling milliliters. That left me moles of sodium hydroxide. I've got my moles of sodium hydroxide canceling my moles of sodium hydroxide. Hey, look, all I have left, I mean, it's like three steps. All I have left is my moles of acid, and that's what I'm ready to do. So when I take my molarity, which we'll get back to, times the volume that I used, 
and then divide that by the thousand milliliters that are in a liter, I get, and don't be surprised if this is a decimal answer, I get my moles of unknown acid. And now I'm ready to do my molar mass. How do we do molar mass? Grams divided by moles. I measured my grams before I started, and I have my moles now from my calculation. I, I, there's my molar mass. I'm done. That simple. So simple calculations, simple lab equipment setup do go a lot slower than I did. Okay, at the very beginning, at first, and just for a little bit at the first, you can let it stream in, but go drop by drop by drop afterwards so that you can get as light a pink color and as exact a measurement from your burette as possible for that titration. Okay. So, again, for the video, I went fast just to get through it. Now, that's the calculations. That's what you need to find molar mass. You really are ready to go. How do I clean this up? I will rinse out the burette and dump any extra sodium hydroxide down the drain. It is safe to go down the drain, especially the fact that it's going to be one molar or less in concentration. This is now neutralized, so this should be very close to neutral anyway. Safe to go down the drain, rinse everything out with water. You only double rinse your burette before you begin, not afterwards. Okay. Now, are we good to go? You're finding molar mass. We measure grams. We do titration to find moles. You divide in the calculator. You find your molar mass. You've answered the lab question. We good? Great, because everything I just did is a lie. Absolutely a lie. I did not do this to show how to do this. That's a good side note there. What I did was I just standardized the base that I'm using in my burette. I did not have an unknown acid in here. What I had was potassium hydrogen phthalate, KHP, a very shelf-stable acid. The problem is the sodium hydroxide in this flask will decompose over time. And sitting in the bottle on the storeroom shelf before I even put it in the flask and dissolved it, it will decompose over time. So even though I measured and think that I have one molar sodium hydroxide in here, I may not have one molar sodium hydroxide in there. In fact, it may be very different. The older the chemical is, the more different it is. And if I mix this up and it's two weeks before you do the lab, I'm going to have other issues there too. So the best thing to do is to standardize your base right before you use it. It is a habit that you should be in anytime you do a titration. And what if the roles were reversed? and we wanted to put in a known acid into an unknown base. Well, we would do the same thing. We would standardize our acid. So be sure you're in the habit of standardizing before you use it. So how do we do that? You're like, whoa, whoa, what, what do we do there? It's not that difficult, okay? It's just another railroad track. Check this out. And you'll notice it's the same exact steps here as I did with my unknown acid but it's just a different railroad track. I started with 1.68 grams of KHP because that's what I measured. That was what you saw in my weight boat. Okay. The molar mass of KHP is 204.23 grams for one mole. I can read that right off the label of the jar. I can look it up on the periodic table. There we go. So now I have grams of KHP into moles of KHP. KHP is monoprotic, and so for every one mole of KHP, we would have one mole of sodium hydroxide. Now, here's where things get a little interesting. I don't need to know moles of sodium hydroxide. I need to know molarity of sodium hydroxide. So I'm going to take my moles of sodium hydroxide and divide by the milliliters I use for my burette. So the same because I was standardizing and not truly titrating, although you do titrate to standardize, okay? What I measured is actually valid here. I have 12.18 gram, or sorry, milliliters of my sodium hydroxide was used. There is nothing above that in my roto track. So you can leave it a blank space, you can put a one in there, but that's fine. That's how I do that. 
So that's the volume I read off my burette. I put my grams that I measured of the white crystal in powder before I started. Now I have moles per, oh, but catch that, I have moles per milliliter. And for molarity, I need moles per liter. So I'm going to do this math here. 1,000 milliliters is one liter. And then I've got that. So yay us, super fun calculator time, right? Okay, so I'm going to take my grams, and I'm going to divide by the molar mass. And I'm going to divide by the volume in milliliters and multiply by the fact that there are 1,000 milliliters in a liter. And I got... And I got very questionable results. I got that my molarity, instead of being one molar, is 13.2 molarity. Are you just going to accept that? Are you going to say, oh, well, that must be what it is? Absolutely not, because I did not even try to put in enough sodium hydroxide to even get close to 13 molarity. It should always be less than what you're expecting. So it's a happy coincidence that I probably messed up in the calculator and got that there. So what do I need to do? I need to recalculate it. And you know what? Looking back at my calculator, I see exactly what happened. I most certainly did not type it in correctly. Somehow my 204.23 became 2.4 times 0.23. Don't know how that happened, but it happened. So that's why I like these calculators with the screens. It, it helps you see what you did. So I'm going to divide by the molar mass. I'm going to divide by the milliliters. I'm going to times by 1,000 milliliters in a liter. And I get... I still get the wrong answer because you know what? I multiplied by 10,000, not 1,000, but that's okay. I can move the decimal. So, you know what? Be smarter than your calculator, please. Point 0.6, and I want to go to 3 sig digs, point 0.675 molarity. Wow, check that out. I thought my molarity was one molar and it's 0.675 molarity. So I'm very glad that I standardized my base before proceeding. Because now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this number in that earlier railroad track instead of the number one. I'm going to go with this number. Now, what does this mean for this year? Should you use this number? Absolutely not, because who knows? How, I mean, if you're like the 10th year I've used this video, there's no way you have the same solution I have here. This is solution specific. So we titrate the very, very specific sodium hydroxide that we're going to be using in our burette. We titrate that with a standard like KHP to standardize it. And then from there on, for every time I use the sodium hydroxide in this bottle here, I'm going to use the number 0.675. What do you use when you come to class? I will tell you. Because by that time, I will have standardized it for that year, for that particular day even, and it will be good to go. But this was to illustrate how to do the titration and how to first standardize. And you'll notice standardization, yeah, it's a longer railroad track, but is it more difficult in terms of a railroad track? No, not at all. It's just another step. It's a nice, easy step, and, most, and this will be done for you. I'll just tell you what it is, unless maybe you want some extra credit, and then you come in and you standardize it for me. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge get some extra credit. Okay, So beyond that, now that it's standardized, what do I do? Well, I would go back to this original railroad track for the lab that I told you. If I could hold it up. There we go. And instead of one, I would use my standardized number there. So please don't use one. Please don't use the num any of the numbers that you got from this lab. Because there's no telling how many years ago this video was made and these numbers aren't valid. Please use the numbers you're given in lab and you determine from your calculation from your beginning and ending measurements here on the burette. All right. So that is how we do titration. That's how we're going to do a titration to determine our unknown acid. And I want to point out that you are ready to just come in and get straight to work on this. It will be standardized, ready to go, and good luck.